Welcome to today's webinar from the International Alliance of ALS and MNB Associations, our second annual glo global clinical trials update. For this webinar, we have English and Spanish captions available. If you're joining us live on Zoom, please check the chat box as we're adding the instructions right now. And if you're watching the recording in our YouTube channel, you will find the instructions in the video description on how to activate the subtitles. Para este seminario web, tenemos subtítulos en inglés y español disponibles. Si se unen a nosotros en vivo vía Zoom, verifiquen la casilla del chat ya que estamos agregando las instrucciones en este momento. Y si está viendo la grabación en nuestro canal de YouTube, encontrará las instrucciones en la descripción del video sobre cómo activar los subtítulos. For those of you who don't know me, I am Jessica May, Programs and Coordinator for the International Alliance of ALS and MND Associations. And today we will be getting information on ALS and MND treatments currently on phase three clinical trials. Today we are joined by Amalex, Biogen, Calico, Clean Nano Medicine, Ionis, and Prelenia. Thank you all for joining us today to be able to give these updates to our ALS and MND community. Our moderators today are Gethin Thomas and Nadia Sethi. Gethin Thomas has been the Executive Director of Research at MND Australia since 2019. He oversees the research grant program and manages national and international partnerships. In 2023, Gethin was chair, chair of the Scientific Advisory Council of the International Alliance, and this year has joined our board of directors. Gethin has over 20 years of experience as a biomedical researcher and has a deep understanding of research strategy and the research funding system. Nadia Sethi joins us, joins us moderating today's webinar. Nadia is the Director of Community Outreach and Engagement for ALS TDI, where she serves as a resource to community members seeking to learn more about the science of ALS TDI and treatments and active clinical trials. She currently serves on the programmatic panel for the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program for ALS. She's also co-chair of the NEALS Patient Education and Advocacy Committee. Uh, she's a member of the Alliance Scientific Advisory Council and has served on multiple advisory panels for pharma companies. Nadia lost her husband to ALS in 2020. Now some final instructions. Any questions you have, please write them in the Zoom Q&A box. And if you're watching from Facebook, you can add your questions in the comments. I also want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who pre-submitted their questions. There is a lot to cover and we will do our absolute best to answer as many questions as we can in the time we have. I will now turn it over to Gethin and Nadia, our moderators for today. Thank you, Jess. And it's an absolute pleasure to be able to uh, moderate this session tonight. Um, well, tonight for me anyway, and maybe morning for most people. Um, so uh, there's not too much further introduction. Thank you for the introduction, Jess. Um, one thing I'd just like to add, uh, just fire in your questions as you hear the talks. Don't think you have to save them until the end or to the Q&A session at the end as a, as a question occurs to you. Uh, please put it in the chat or or in the Q&A and uh, we'll collate them all at the end. And, and as Jess said, we'll try and get through them. There's quite a few already lined up, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll have time to get through them all. We've got a fantastic uh, lineup of companies running some really uh, key trials and some really interesting treatments. And I think that's uh, all you need to hear from me. Nadia, would you like to add anything? Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, and thanks for, for having me today. I'm very excited to hear today's presentations. Um, I also wanted to share that ALS TDI is very excited to announce that we're going to be launching the beta version of a tool called ALS Trial Navigator in early February. Um, and this big tool has a set of three tools within it, the first of which is called the, the Guided Trial Finder, where people will be able to answer a series of questions about their ALS and then get a, a customized list of trials that they might be a fit for. Um, and then there's also going to be a global map that shows trial sites around the world um, and also a browser where people can kind of search through all of the trials that are happen happening internationally 
Um, we are pulling from every trial registry that we could find around the world. And so we're trying to be a very comprehensive resource. Um, and we are sharing not only interventional drug trials, but we're also sharing observational studies and also trials of symptom management. We're, we're splitting everything up very clearly. So very, very excited for this launch um, in early February. And we're going to go ahead and drop a link um, in the chat um, that references a blog um, that talks a little bit more about this tool. But super excited to be here today. And um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, okay, Jess, uh, I think we're good to start running the webinars. And uh, I'm also super excited about the uh, ALS TDI Navigator as well. And perhaps we might come to uh, get a few more questions on that as well later on if we have time. So I think we're good to go, Jess. Great, thank you. So uh, please uh, do shout out if for whatever reason the technical doesn't work and you can't hear the sound. So uh, do let me know. Hello, my name is Michelle Manuel. I'm Vice President and Global Head of Medical Affairs at Amelix Pharmaceuticals. It's my pleasure today to bring you an update on the Amelix Phase 3 Phoenix trial. Many thanks to the International Alliance for allowing us this opportunity to share with you. Amelix 35 is a combination of two different compounds, sodium phenylbutyrate and tercidiol, often abbreviated PB and terso. Amex 35 was previously studied in ALS in the phase two CENTAR trial. In the CENTAR trial, evaluations included safety and tolerability, disease progression as measured by the ALS functional rating scale revised, as well as survival. The Phoenix trial ended recruitment in February of 2023. We announced that enrollment had completed um, therefore, there's no longer any recruitment of participants in the Phoenix trial. As of today, January 2024, an open label extension is ongoing in Europe, and I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. Excitingly, the results for the Phase 3 Phoenix trial are expected in the second quarter of 2024. The open label extension in Europe allows participants who complete the 48 week double blind treatment to enroll into the open label extension or OLE. All participants who enroll in the OLE will receive the open label treatment with active AMX 35 for an additional 108 weeks. The OLE will extend the assessment of safety and efficacy of AMX 35 and ALS further. The Phoenix trial scope is quite broad with sites in 12 countries, 69 sites total with 664 participants. The split between Europe and the US is 552 versus 112. Countries included are Belgium, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, the United States, and the United Kingdom. If you have any inquiries, just general information, please contact us at info at amylix.com. If you have queries regarding advocacy, please write to advocacy at amylix.com. Thank you for your attention, and thank you again to the Alliance for allowing us this opportunity. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Amelix, for that uh, overview of your trial. So uh, our next trial, uh, next presentation is coming from uh, Biogen. So uh, uh, we can uh, start the Biogen presentation. Thank you.
All right, so many thanks for the opportunity to provide an update on ongoing studies uh, with Tofersen, uh, including the ATLAS trial, uh, which you may be familiar with, is the first interventional study in pre-symptomatic uh, ALS, and notably this study is currently enrolling. It's very important to point out that these trials would certainly not be possible uh, without the substantial contributions of trial participants, uh, their families, caregivers, and ALS researchers, who we are incredibly grateful for. Uh, my name is Steve Graffalo, and I am a medical director in the Neuromuscular Development Unit at Biogen, and I currently support uh, the ongoing uh, TOFERS and clinical studies that you'll hear about uh, later today. And with that, uh, very grateful for your time today. All right, so just a little bit of background on Tofersen. Um, outside the United States, uh, Tofersen is investigational uh, and has not been licensed uh, for use. Uh, within the US, uh, Tofersen or Calsadi uh, has been approved by the FDA uh, for the treatment of ALS in adults uh, who have a mutation in the uh, superoxide dismutase 1 or SOD1 gene. Uh, this indication has been approved under the accelerated approval pathway based on a reduction in plasma neurofilament light chain uh, that's been observed in patients uh, treated with Calsadi. Notably, continued approval for this indication uh, may be contingent upon verification of clinical benefit and confirmatory studies. As you may know, uh, in approximately 2% of people living with ALS, the disease is attributed to a mutation in the gene encoding the superoxide dismutase 1 or SOD1 enzyme. This leads to accumulation of a toxic form of the SOD1 protein that results in the degeneration of motor neurons. Tofersen is an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO, that is being developed uh, for the treatment of ALS associated with a mutation in the SOD1 enzyme. Tofersen binds to SOD1 uh, messenger RNA, leading to recruitment of the RNA's H enzyme and subsequent degradation of the SOD1 uh, messenger RNA transcript. Reduction of this transcript uh, then ultimately leads to reduction of SOD1 protein which would be expected to slow the neurodegenerative process in SOD1 ALS. So Tofersen has been evaluated in several clinical studies, uh, two of which are ongoing that I will speak about today. The first of these ongoing studies is the open label uh, extension trial uh, known as 233AS102, uh, which was designed to evaluate the long-term effects of Tofersen uh, in people who previously completed uh, the parent multi-part study uh, known as 233AS101, uh, uh, which included the Valor study. Uh, enrollment in this open label extension study is complete and the study is expected to conclude uh, later this year. As you may know, uh, integrated results uh, from the pivotal phase three Valor study and an interim uh, data analysis uh, from this open label extension trial were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2022. Uh, these data help us better understand uh, the long-term effects of tofersen uh, in the symptomatic SOD1 uh, ALS population. The second ongoing tofersen study is ATLAS. So ATLAS is a phase three uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial that was designed to evaluate uh, whether pre-symptomatic initiation of tofersen can halt or delay the emergence of clinically manifest ALS and or slow the progression uh, of the disease. ATLAS comprises uh, four study parts uh, with each part having a unique design. Part A is a natural history run-in period uh, in which no uh, study treatment is administered. In this part of the study, adult participants with a confirmed uh, SOD1 mutation will have their blood neurofilament light chain levels uh, monitored on a monthly basis. As you may know, uh, neurofilament light chain is a protein that is released from neurons in response to axonal damage and neuronal injury. Importantly, in a previous natural history study uh, known as the pre-symptomatic uh, familial ALS or prefal study, neurofilament light chain levels uh, were found to increase prior to the emergence of signs or symptoms of ALS in individuals who were at genetic risk of developing uh, ALS. This study, which was led by Dr. Benatar uh, and the team at the University of Miami, was really critical in laying the groundwork uh, for the ATLAS study. So participants in part A, uh, they can move to other study parts uh, depending on 
their neurofilm at light chain level, and their status um, in terms of uh, clinically manifest ALS. So for participants in Part A, uh, whose neurofilm at light chain levels meet the pre-specified threshold uh, for Part B, they will be screened for inclusion uh, within Part B. Part B is a randomized, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled part in which participants will be randomized one-to-one uh, -to, -one to receive tofersin at 100 milligrams or placebo via intrathecal uh, injection. Participants in Part B who meet the criteria for clinically manifest ALS during Part B can be screened for Part C. Part C is an open-label extension in which all participants will receive uh, tofersin. And Part D, uh, this is a study part that includes eligible participants from Part A who meet the criteria for clinically manifest ALS prior to randomization in uh, Part B. And Part D is an open-label study part in which all participants uh, receive tofersin. So this slide highlights some of the key eligibility criteria for participation in the ATLAS study. Of note, this is only a subset of all of the eligibility criteria, and individuals will need to meet all study criteria in order to participate. So ATLAS is enrolling individuals uh, who are 18 years of age and older, who are clinically pre-symptomatic, who have a plasma neurofilm at light chain below uh, the study threshold, and who carry a SOD1 mutation uh, that is associated with higher complete penetrance and rapid disease progression. And so the ATLAS protocol includes 17 mutations that have strong evidence for high penetrance and rapid disease progression. And for other SOD1 variants that are not listed, an independent uh, mutation adjudication committee has been set up to evaluate other mutations for inclusion on the basis of the scientific literature, family pedigree evidence, uh, or other sources. So the ATLAS study aims to enroll 150 people uh, in Part A, the natural history run-in period. Of these 150 people, target enrollment uh, for Part B, which is the pivotal part of the study, is 28 uh, individuals. The study is currently enrolling at 29 sites across 14 countries uh, that are depicted here. And individuals who are interested in participating in the study can speak with their physician uh, to obtain more information. Uh, and finally, uh, I'd like to close by really sharing my enormous gratitude for all of the individuals who participate in ALS clinical trials, their families and caregivers. Um, it's really only because of this participation uh, that we can evaluate if investigational treatments are tolerable and effective for individuals uh, living with ALS. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for that presentation, Steve. And um, next up, we have Paul Malik from Calico Life Sciences. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Malik, and I'm a clinical scientist at Calico. I'm here representing a large team to tell you about ABVV CLS7262, which is being developed for the treatment of ALS. To understand how 7262 might work in ALS, we first have to think about a pathway called the Integrated Stress Response, or ISR. The ISR is a biological pathway that is conserved throughout nature. It helps cells respond to different kinds of stress, such as a shortage of nutrients or problems with its quality control machinery. Now, when this pathway is persistent and dysregulated, we think that that is involved in the pathophysiology of ALS. We found this pathway activated in people with ALS. ISR activation leads to a reduction in normal protein synthesis, an increase in the production of stress proteins, which could be harmful for the cell at toxic levels, and formation of stress granules containing TDP43, one of the hallmark proteins of ALS pathology. Stress granules could be packets of untranslated mRNA that form when translation is halted. Now, 7262 inhibits the ISR and brings down or attenuates some of these effects by activating a target called EIF2B, which is a key regulator of the ISR. In normal conditions, two proteins, EIF2 and EIF2B, contribute to protein translation and help our cells synthesize essential proteins. When there is a persistent ISR, EIF2 becomes phosphorylated, which changes it from a substrate of EIF2B to an inhibitor of EIF2B. Translation is slowed down, and the synthesis of essential proteins is reduced. Instead, stress proteins may accumulate to toxic levels. 
Stress granules, or bundles of untranslated mRNA containing TDP43, can accumulate in the cell cytosol and may seed aggregates of TDP43 under certain conditions. Ultimately, we think by this mechanism, a persistent ISR can lead to cell death, neurodegeneration, and ALS. Now, 7262, as an EIF2B activator, is thought to rescue motor neurons from these harmful and persistent stress conditions. 7262 not only boosts the activity of EIF2B, but also changes the shape of EIF2B to make it less sensitive to inhibition by that phosphorylated EIF2. We think that 7262 will restore normal protein production in stressed nerve cells, reduce levels of stress proteins that may lead to nerve cell death, and dissolve stress granules that may lead to TDP43 aggregates. We hope to reduce or prevent further sequestration of TDP43 in cells affected by ALS. Overall, with treatment, we hypothesize that cell function and viability will be improved. These hypotheses are supported by a wealth of preclinical data, and while we don't have too much time together today, I would encourage you to check out our previous webinars on YouTube by our head of clinical science, Bill Cho. He discusses some of the in vitro experiments showing effects on TDP43 containing stress granules in human motor neuron cell culture, as well as evidence from experiments in animals showing that EIF2B activators can help neurons survive harmful stress conditions, such as after an optic nerve crush or when there is a mutation in EIF2B. ABVV CLS7262 has completed phase one and has moved on to the next stage. Let's talk about what has happened in humans in phase one. First, the drug was well tolerated following administration to more than 100 healthy volunteers for up to two weeks. All adverse events were mild to moderate in severity and there were no serious adverse events. In this same trial, the drug increased EIF2B activity and suppressed the ISR in blood cells collected from healthy volunteers. In people with ALS, the drug was adequately well tolerated. Some participants have now been treated for more than one year. Most adverse events uh, were mild to moderate in severity. Some serious adverse events did occur. The serious adverse events were consistent with expectations of ALS. In both of these studies, the drug entered the cerebrospinal fluid and was present at concentrations hypothesized to activate EIF2B. Let's look at the development timeline for 7262 in ALS. Following phase one, we were able to dose our first person with ALS in fall of 2021. In this phase 1b study, we looked at three doses of 7262 or placebo for a short four-week period, followed by a long-term active treatment extension. Following this trial, we entered the Healy platform trial as Regimen F. Regimen F is a phase 2-3 study enrolling 300 participants, and we dose our first participant in the spring of 2023. Around the same time, we're also very excited to report that we dosed our first participant with, with vanishing white matter disease, a parallel indication which we'll talk about later. It's important to note that as part of a platform trial, participants can't choose which regimen they get assigned to, but our regimen, Regimen F, is one of the actively enrolling regimens. In this regimen, 7262 will be taken by mouth once a day. Overall, approximately 300 participants are going to be enrolled, and these participants will be randomly assigned to receive 7262 or placebo in a 3 to 1 ratio for the 6 month placebo controlled period. We'll also divide participants to one of two dose levels, both of which hypothesize to activate the IF2B. Following the randomized control period, uh, there will be an active treatment extension in which all participants can receive 7262 for approximately one year. We're grateful to collaborate with Dr. Merit Sukovic. Dr. Sendadris, Niels, and the Healy ALS platform trial. This trial is being conducted at up to 74 Niels affiliated sites in the United States. We're also very excited to share a parallel development program for our EIF2B activator in vanishing white matter disease. We've initiated a small phase 1b study in the United States that will be expanding to include one site in the Netherlands as well. Vanishing white matter disease is an ultra-rare and severe neurodegenerative condition that's caused by mutations in the target protein, EIF2B. Now, at present, uh, as the drug is a new investigational drug that's not yet approved in any country, its use is restricted to clinical trials, and we don't have other programs to share with you at this time. But as we generate more safety information, we're looking forward to the time when 7262 may become available through an expanded access program for those who don't qualify for the ongoing clinical trials. We'd like to offer a huge thank you to all the investigators, trial participants, and families for helping to advance our clinical programs. You can learn more about Calico and our clinical trials at calicolabs.com slash patients.
Uh, thank you for that. And uh, next uh, uh, presentation is from Clean, Medicine, uh, Clean Nanomedicine, and we have uh, Benjamin Greenberg uh, uh, presenting their uh, clinical trial data. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Benjamin Greenberg, and I serve as the head of medical for Clean Nanomedicine, a biotech company dedicated to the development of advanced therapeutics for neurodegenerative disorders such as ALS, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. By way of disclaimer, the forward-looking statements are listed here. Let's turn to the notion of neurodegeneration in the fact that in a variety of different disorders, neurons die due to mitochondrial dysfunction and deficits in the NAD pathway. If we look to the world of ALS, there are multiple multitude of different pathologies that can lead to upper and lower motor neuron death, whether it's through familial disorders or sporadic conditions, neurons can undergo a variety of insults that lead to degeneration. But at the core of this neuronal death is a loss of NAD and hence a loss of mitochondrial function. This loss leads to not only the neuronal death, but the symptoms that our patients suffer from. CNM AU8 is a fascinating molecule that serves as a surface catalytic agent to improve mitochondrial function. It is not a small molecule. It is not a monoclonal antibody but rather a crystalline form of gold that allows for NADH to convert to NAD without the requirement of any cellular machinery. This increase in NAD levels improves mitochondrial function, leads to enhanced neuronal survival and enhanced neuronal function. And it's via this mechanism of action that CNM AU8 exerts its neuroprotective capabilities in patients with ALS. CLEAN has embarked on a number of late stage clinical trial and open label studies of CNM AU8 in order to prove the safety and efficacy of this intervention. Two randomized phase two double blind placebo controlled trials, Rescue ALS and the Healy ALS platform each delivered very promising results relative to both the efficacy and safety of this agent. Furthermore, Clean Nanomedicine has remained committed to expanded access protocols that provide us with more data from real world situations. Let's look at the data from each of these relative to the efficacy, but before I do, please note that with over 500 years of subject exposure, we have not identified a safety signal relative to treatment related serious adverse events. And it is with this backdrop of safety that I'm excited to share with you the efficacy data. First, if you look to the world of ALS and the definition of clinical worsening, in two independent phase two trials, the Rescue ALS study and the Healy ALS platform, CNM AU8 was able to outperform placebo in a statistically significant way. Over the 36 weeks of the rescue ALS study, there was a decline in the rate of death, tracheostomy, assisted ventilation, or feeding tube placement. Similarly, in the 24-week double-blind placebo-controlled Healy platform, there was a statistically significant separation of the curves, showing that CNM AU8 prevented clinical worsening in ALS patients. If we move on to the incredibly important outcome of survival, you can look to the rescue ALS study, which included a 36 week double blind period followed by an open label extension. And you can find that those individuals who were treated early with CNM AU8 had a better survival over 168 weeks than those who had a delayed onset of treatment. If you were to take the placebo arm and model out their outcomes without intervention, CNM AU8 would lead to over a 19 month survival benefit compared to that original placebo arm. If we look to the double line period in the Healy ALS platform, CNM AU8 led to a greater than 90% risk reduction of death at 24 weeks with the 30 milligram dose. It is with this data that CLEAN has been committed to a phase three trial in ALS known as the RESTORE ALS trial. 
We will be studying in a placebo controlled fashion with two to one randomization, CNM AU8 30 milligrams relative to placebo in a global study. The key endpoints of this study are first and foremost, improved survival, and then a variety of secondary endpoints based on delayed time of clinical worsening for those treated with CNM AU8 as compared to placebo. Our timeline and path forward relative to ALS include a multitude of studies that continue on through 2023 and 2024, and the launch of additional expanded access protocols and the global phase three study for CNM AU8 in ALS. During this time, we continue to engage with regulatory agencies and we look forward to the following year. Thank you for your attention. And if you require or are interested in further information, please contact us at info at clean.com. And thank you for that presentation from Clean Nanomedicine. And next up, we have Becky Crean from Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Becky Crean, Executive Director of Clinical Development at Ionis Pharmaceuticals. And first, I want to thank the Alliance for inviting me to provide an update on our ALS program. Um, but before we do that, for those who may not be familiar with who we are, um, I'll tell you a little bit about IONIS. We were founded in 1989, a little over 30 years ago, with really a single mission in mind, which was to develop a new platform for drug discovery and to develop RNA-targeted therapeutics or antisense therapies. And we've been at this for about the last 30 plus years, and we've had some success with it. We have about 900 employees that are growing. Our research and development headquarters are located in San Diego, California, which is where most of us are, but we also have additional offices in Boston, Massachusetts, and also Dublin, Ireland. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm gonna spend the next few minutes um, talking about the, um, the biology behind our program to treat FUS ALS and how our ASO works. Um, but I'll take a step back first to, to help you understand ASOs and to better understand those, you have to kind of go back a little bit to your high school biology days and to the central dogma of biology. And this is really an oversimplification of this concept, but basically DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. So if you go to the left-hand side of the screen, you'll look at the DNA and that contains the information needed to make all of our proteins. It's the material that codes all of our genetic information. And DNA, we like to think of it really as the recipe book of life. And those are the instructions that live within our cells that tell our body how to produce every protein that we need. And in FUS ALS, there's a change in the DNA uh, that causes this protein, the FUS protein, to misbehave. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. But the information in the DNA is then copied or translated into RNA messages, and that's in the middle panel. In FUS ALS, this RNA is a copy of the DNA that carries the abnormal code. So this means that the information needed to build the fused and sarcoma protein isn't correct. And so if it's incorrect in the DNA, it gets miscoded in the RNA, and then it makes the misbehaving protein. This just keeps happening over and over again. But you can interrupt that process or fix it with an ASO. And an ASO is a small string of nucleotides that you can design so that it binds specifically to an RNA of interest. Then they can either activate the protein production, they can also deactivate protein production. And so in FUS ALS, the ASO actually deactivates the protein production so the body doesn't overproduce it. So really the therapeutic rationale for using eulifnersin, which is what we're using in the clinic right now in people with FUS ALS, is that if you reduce the production of FUS, it'll reduce the aggreg aggregation and toxic gain of function that the FUS protein is doing in the body. This will in turn reduce motor neuron um, degeneration, and we believe it will also slow or stop the disease progression. And the study is the way we're going to test that and prove that hypothesis. 
So we've taken this ASO, ULIF Nursen, and are conducting a phase three global pivotal registration trial. And that's gonna be used to generate and collect the information and the data we need to give to regulators who eventually, hopefully would approve the drug um, so that all people living with FES ALS would have access to it. Now we initiated the study a couple of years ago in 2021, and um, we've been enrolling uh, we'll continue enrolling um, for the next uh, year and a half or so. Um, we let's see. Um, in part one, there's two to three parts to this trial. In part one, that's the double blind placebo controlled portion where um, you are assigned either to drug or placebo for 18 months. Um, you have uh, two out of three people will get active drug and one out of three would get a placebo. And that's really generating the data we need to look at our drug against no drug to see how it reacts in people's body and if it does what we intend it to do. So once participants complete that first part, then they enroll into what we call an open label treatment extension. And this is where everybody receives drug. There's no placebo. Um, this can last anywhere from two to five years, but our intention is to keep this open so that participants can have access to the drug until we have marketing approval or the programs discontinued. In the meantime, we continue to work our way around the globe um, and open up sites in different countries. So this is where the study is taking place. It's all over the globe. We've got a total of 19 active sites across 12 countries, which you can see here on the map. We're in the US, Canada, Europe, the UK, Ireland, and also parts of Asia. Um, those are all active sites. We're also in the process of activating sites in South America, Japan, and Taiwan. So even though uh, we have sites yeah. spread out across the globe, the closest site may still require some travel to get to it. So we've set up a travel assistance program through a company called Clinciers. And what they do is they help with patients and caregivers getting to the site. They arrange all the travel, um, take care of all travel related costs. Those are all covered by the study. They'll even make the travel arrangements for you. Um, and we hope that this helps keep the focus on the treatment study and not have to worry about travel arrangements and paying for things to be in a trial. Um, the other thing about this program that we're doing is um, we're also providing no cost genetic testing. Um, and with that also pre and post genetic counseling through our sponsored genetic testing program. So right now, this is in the US and Canada. Um, Europe should be opening soon and we hope to initiate in Asia as well. So the testing program includes all ages um, that are eligible from 12 and up. Um, your doctor um, must suspect ALS or have a family history of ALS to be able to use this program for testing. Um, if you're under 18 years of age, and again, we'll test uh, you down to 12 years old. If you're under 18 years of age, um, you must have symptoms. Um, for those individuals that are above 18 years, you can be pre-symptomatic, meaning you don't have symptoms, but you have a family history of ALS. So we've tried to make it as broad as we can. Um, I also mentioned genetic counseling. This is done through a company called Gene Matters. Um, they provide pre and post genetic counseling. Um, the, the genetic test itself requires a blood, saliva, or buccal swab um, that gets collected from the individual, and it's run through a panel that has 33 different genes on it. So it covers a broad range, not just fuss. Um, to find out more about this program and, and how to access, access it, you can go to the Prevention Genetics um, website here at the bottom of the screen. So those are just a few things about the program um, that might be of interest in, um, to you as well. So I'll end by providing some information here about how to get in contact with us um, and how to learn more about the Fusion Trial. We have some websites. We have a direct telephone line. Uh, there's also clinicaltrials.gov that has the most up-to-date information. Um, so we hope that you will reach out if you have any questions or are potentially interested in participating. But with that, I want to express my sincere appreciation for your time today and for listening to our update. Um, all of us at IONIS really are deeply committed 
to the uh, to continue the work that we do on behalf of the ALS community. And, and honestly, we couldn't do it without you. So we thank you for your commitment to doing this together. So thank you very much. I am so thrilled. Uh, thank you, Becky. And now we move on to our last presentation. Uh, we have Michael Hayden from uh, Prilinia. Thank you. To have this privilege and opportunity to talk to the Alliance of ALS Associations globally. What a really thrill it is to have this opportunity to interact with all of you. Today, I want to share with you information about predopidine for the treatment of ALS. This is a drug that's in investigation and development for ALS and Huntington disease. It's an oral drug that is very safe, has a safety profile very similar to placebo. We know the mechanism of action. It binds to a receptor in the brain called the Sigma-1 receptor. And we've already shown in prior studies as part of the platform trial run from Mass General that the drug may show uh, maintenance of function, improved speech, and also respiratory function. One of the areas that makes us particularly confident about this particular drug is its mechanism of action. It binds the sigma-1. It's already been shown by others that if you have a mutation or a sequencing, a spelling error in the sigma-1 gene, you get ALS. And furthermore, the extent of the severity of the mutation it correlates with when you get ALS. If you have no sigma-1, you get a childhood or juvenile onset ALS. If you have a little bit of function, you get adult onset ALS. So this is very profound validation of this. We've then gone on to show that if you increase the activity of sigma-1, you get ben beneficial effects. This was regimen D as part of the platform trial. And this was the platform trial run at Mass General Hospital. It included 120 people on predopidine and a shared placebo that included 164 patients, but also 42 specifically for this particular regimen. We looked at numerous pre-specified uh, measurements, including ALS, FRS, speech, yeah respiration, bulb function, and also quality of life. And we were particularly interested in patients that had definite ALS and had early onset, in other words, less than 18 months from onset, and also those that were fast progressors. So here you can see that, for example, in the improvement in ALS FRS that actually show, slowed the decline, you can see when you get to people who are definite ALS and less than 18 months duration, you get improvement uh, over placebo. And if you get to the real fast progressors, even though the numbers are small, you get quite a profound slowing of progression as seen in the ALS FRS, the key measure for progression in, in ALS. And here you can see it. This is patients who were actually on placebo, they go down as expected, but you get slowing of progression, manifested eight weeks, continued to week 16, and overall around a 40% reduction in those very deaf uh, patients who were early uh, with less than 18 months duration and faster. So this was really exciting. A big impact was on speech uh, and uh, speaking rate and articulation rate. And here you can see, again, this is showing improvement. You can see in the definite less than 18 months, you see improvement in articulation rate, the same for speaking rate. And even when you look at the fast progressors, even though the numbers are small, the p-value shows highly significant improvement, both in articulation rate and speaking rate. That again is an important function. When we also look at uh, looking at quality of life, Again, in the definite patients and people who had less than 18 months duration, you again, even though the numbers are small, you see improvement in the quality of life. Also, we have now done, together with Mass General, a detailed analysis of survival. And remember, these were patients who were six months on 
predopinine six months on placebo, then open label. And if you go to the 50% survival probability, you can see that if you were initially on placebo, you had a 50% survival probability. But if you were on predopinine all that time, you actually had an 85% survival probability. And when you look further and you see uh, uh, at the 50% probability of survival, what you can see is that patients who were on predopinine all this time, their survival was increased by about 10 months. All of this is uh, early data and very exciting. And this led the government of the United States to fund uh, expanded access for patients with ALS who would not be part of our trial. So these would be patients, for example, who would have onset for greater than 24 months. And this is to provide expanded access to about 200 ALS patients. So all of this is allowing us to plan for our phase three study. It's anticipated that this will start in the second half of 2024. We're going to be looking at patients having learned from the platform study who have less than 18 months of diagnosis, definite and probable. And we're going to be looking at all those issues that we saw some suggestion of an effect, function, speech, quality of life and survival. And the duration of the study uh, is likely to be uh, six months to one year, the exact time duration of the study not completely yet decided on. If you want to know more about this, we suggest you contact Seth Rotberg, our outstanding senior manager of patient advocacy, or you visit www.prelenia.com. This is a company that's absolutely committed to doing everything we can with a safe oral drug to have some impact on the devastation of ALS for the ALS community. Thank you for giving me the opportunity of talking with you, and we look forward to more interaction in the future. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for uh, those wonderful presentations. Um, we're going to be opening up for Q&A now. Um, and we've got some great questions in our chat. So um, I'm going to go ahead and we we have um, we have representation from all of the companies, I think, except for Calico Life Sciences. So um, you're welcome to come on screen. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's see. We have a, a questions about expanded access. So um, it seems like all of the companies have either had an expanded access program or have an upcoming one. Um, so how do people apply to these programs um, and how do we expand them to more countries? I can start. Hi everyone, Marjan Sipasi from Clean Nanomedicine. Um, it's a great question. And I think um, from a company perspective, Clean has, um, always thought expanded access programs and fair equitable distribution of in investigational products, um, especially to those who don't qualify for clinical trials is, is inc incredibly important and gathering the real world evidence um, that's generated as such. So we've already had several expanded access programs that are still ongoing. Um, and more recently, the uh, we are one of the programs that was granted NIH funding. So that will be a new program that we hope to start um, in the next few months, I hope by Q2 of this year. We hope to, I know there was questions in the chat about providing numbers, um, approximately 100 or so new spots will be available in the NIH funded EAP that goes beyond those that we have existing at the moment. Uh, just a quick uh, join to that. Um, the, does the NIH funding allow uh, spots to be um, supported outside of the US or are they only for trials within the US? Yeah, unfortunately, um, the funding is just US specific at this time. It is government sponsored, correct. Thank you. Um, I can add uh, for Prolenia um, that, um, like Clean, we're very happy to announce that we will also start the NIH uh, Act for ALS. 
uh, approximately 200 spaces will be open for new uh, participants that will not be eligible to participate in our planned phase three study. Um, and we're currently working with Healy to um, initiate that um, as soon as possible. Nani, if I can, I can, um, think, thinking about outside the US per Gethin's question, um, you know, we had a special access program in Canada previously a U.S. expanded access program. Uh, there's different terminologies globally, uh, things like named patient and a cohort. Um, so expanded access is a very specific term for the U.S. In other parts of the world, for example, in Europe, we just started um, a, a program through the French government. And it really in other parts of the world, just as in the U.S., it starts with a physician request. And many countries do allow once there is a US approval or a European approval, they allow some various sorts of importation of approved products that are still not approved in the countries or not reimbursed even in, in various countries. So it really is, um, my advice would be, be for advocacy groups within each of the countries to really understand what pathway their country can operate through and, and really connect with the physician ALS leaders and, and the government regulators in each country to best understand that pathway, because it is very different for every country. And this is Steve Raffle on the Biogen side. Thanks everyone for um, addressing that question. It's a great question. Uh, so following the results of the Valor study and benefit risk assessment, um, a global expanded access program uh, was opened for uh, Tofersen. Uh, that is available in countries where regulators um, have approved uh, access for the program um, and where treating healthcare professionals uh, have met local requirements. Um, so that program is no longer available in the US. Um, as, as mentioned, Tofersen has been approved under the accelerated approval pathway uh, by the FDA, but in other countries where the expanded access program um, has a path to operate, um, we do have um, sites that are open. Um, and if you would like more information, we would encourage you to speak to your physician who can then follow up with additional steps uh, around the expanded access program. But great question. Thanks, Steve. I'll, uh, I'll follow on. I think I'm the last one here. Uh, Chris Yun, I'm filling in for uh, Becky Crane uh, for my illness. Uh, for the fusion study, since this is our very first trial in ALS patients, uh, we actually were able to do the rare uh, the rarity of the patient population get agreement from all the countries were uh, currently conducting trials to run a phase one through three trial to try to move the development as quickly as possible. So therefore, we are currently still establishing the safety and efficacy of the drug. So um, the EAP program is not currently available, uh, but it's certainly something that our team is uh, carefully uh, reviewing on a regular basis. Um, and as soon as we have some more information on that, we will share uh, the EAP policy and, and guidance is on the ILMS website if anybody's interested in uh, reviewing our positions at this moment. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, covering that question so well. Um, we have a question that's just come up in the chat now. Uh, specifically talking about uh, ALS Vietnam and uh, uh, the questions around what hesitations uh, companies have about conducting trials in the ASEAN area and how can these uh, countries help address these concerns. But I think that's a wider concern as well. It's not just uh, ASEAN countries, Asia countries, also obviously Africa and uh, South America as well. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, if you could uh, address that question at all, we'll discuss it. Yeah, this is Steve on the Biogen side again, and I think it's an excellent, uh, excellent question. Uh, maybe I can speak more generally, just sort of about uh, trial feasibility. So, obviously, there's a number of considerations that go into assessing whether uh, specific sites and countries uh, are appropriate for clinical trials. So, you know, as a key you know, first criteria for the study population, does the regional population have individuals who would meet all trial eligibility criteria? I think that's an important one, important one to consider. And then in terms of uh, feasibility, how feasible is it to conduct a clinical trial um, in the given uh, geography? 
are there expert centers uh, with enough resource uh, and capacity? And then thinking through uh, potential barriers. Um, so are there any issues regarding like sample export, uh, centralized testing, uh, being able to export samples outside the country if centralized testing is set up for uh, a given study? Um, and then also, is there a pathway to sustained uh, treatment access? So if the drug demonstrates a favorable benefit risk, is there a path to regulatory approval, uh, reimbursement and access? So that's a really important consideration as well. Um, but it's a great question. And you know, I would say looking ahead, really important to include as many geographies as feasible to best represent uh, study populations and address capacity and resource challenges uh, that are present at sites that are currently uh, enrolling and participating in many of the ALS clinical trials. So I know that was kind of a general answer, but that's sort of the framework by which um, these decisions are evaluated uh, on the Biogen side. Steve, I can um, add a little bit specifically from clean nanomedicine. Um, we, uh, as Gethin mentioned, this goes uh, beyond Asian. Um, we are looking um, pretty astutely at various areas within South America, um, New Zealand, which traditionally hasn't been very much involved, um, uh, Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia, we've had some experience and discussions with folks there. So um, definitely it, it's top of mind and absolutely needed in the space. But, you know, to Steve's point, there's many things that need to go into making sure um, that uh, those specific regions are included, but we're definitely making that effort and hope to include regions outside. And essentially, eventually we will have to, right? Because in order to uh, conduct so many trials, we are going to have to go to regions um, that have the patient populations that are needed to conduct the studies and meet these enrollment criteria, as well, just from a basic science perspective. So absolutely. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have any uh, further comments around the, um, that issue? I'll move on to the next question. Uh, we have a very quick question here. So um, this is for uh, Steve. Uh, when will the Atlas trial, when do you hope the Atlas trial will finish enrollment? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so overall target enrollment in part A, the natural history part is 150 uh, individuals. And so far we have enrolled 105 individuals. Um, ultimately we are attempting to enroll uh, 28 uh, total participants in part B, the randomized portion. Uh, so when the trial uh, meets the 150 participants in part A, uh, at this stage, based on the current protocol, part A enrollment uh, will end. Uh, but ultimately, we are looking to enroll 28 uh, total participants um, in Part B. Uh, based on our current enrollment rates, uh, we anticipate, um, and it's, it's very fluid given um, some of the challenges with enrollment, um, that we would see enrollment close around um, the Q4 2025 timeframe. Uh, but again, those, um, those timelines are fluid based on what we're seeing in terms of overall enrollment. Thank you. Then we have a, another question that just came up in chat. Um, do patients enrolling in trials need to be residents of the countries that the trials are being conducted in? And can you enroll non-residents that travel to participate in trials? I, I, could, I could start. Um, yeah, this is uh, Chris Yun with the Fusion Study. Uh, for our trial, as mentioned, uh, 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 patients with FUS fairly rare, so uh, it's hard to have a uh, country in uh, a center in every country, obviously. So we do allow uh, participants to travel from another country to another, uh, especially where geography is uh, more amenable to that, uh, such as Europe. So um, the map that Becky showed has the list of countries that are uh, active and also coming up soon. So. Um, Europe would be a good example, but we also have sites in Asia. Uh, we'll also have a site in uh, South America and Brazil. So uh, we do, depending on the patient's, of course, uh, clinical status, uh, whether it's safe to travel a certain distance. So we will take those on a case-by-case -case basis, but short answer is yes, uh, we do allow that. I can, I can add on to that as well at Emelix. We have allowed that and, and the two, and both the Centaur and the Phoenix trial. 
and it's as Chris pointed out, it's really all about the individual um, primary investigator of assessing the patient and or the participant and their ability to to travel throughout the duration of the trial, just to make sure that there's not missing data, because every data point that is missed can have an impact on the evaluation of the data at the end of the study. Thank you for that. Um, and then we had a question about genetic testing. Um, so uh, are companies that supply genetic testing, um, are, are you able to share that data with um, observational studies that a person might be participating in? And is there a way that we can get to a point where we test once and then that data is put to, to use more broadly? Or maybe another question would be uh, for for the for the pro, for the trials that are incorporating genetic testing, um, is that data being shared beyond just your own study? This is Steve at Biogen. That's a that's a great question. Um, I think we go to great strides to protect personal health information, just given all the implications that genetic testing results can have on an individual's life. Um, so we're very careful about that data, and we don't have mechanisms set up to share that type of data outside uh, outside the study. Um, but that, you know, I think that's something that can be evaluated on a case by case basis. But um, just in terms of overall, you know, study conduct, we are very careful with that, with that type of information. Uh, but there are other genetic testing programs. Uh, for example, Biogen has an ALS identified program uh, where individuals can undergo genetic testing and be screened for, I think, up to between 20 and 30 genes. Um, I'm not sure how that information can make its way through the healthcare system. Um, but those are some other avenues to be explored as well. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I could add on to Steve's comment similarly that uh, we uh, take the personal data very uh, seriously. So but our uh, sponsor program through Prevention Genetic is, is outside of our trial. So uh, the patients own the data. So patient and their healthcare provider can decide to share that data with anyone they like. So uh, they have full control of the genetic data that they receive. And as mentioned, we provide pre and post counseling as well. So uh, it, it truly is up to the patient, but we do not currently have a mechanism to um, share uh, electronically or send uh, uh, data to uh, other uh, organizations. I'll also add just a perspective, obviously for, for our product, it's not, dependent on a specific genetic mutation, but just to point out for the community, in case you're not aware, Precision ALS in Europe and the Act for ALS actually is funding, um, you know, creating repositories of, of information, including genetic information. So it really <clears throat> is a more, is, it's taking a step outside being a sponsor company and being responsible for it. it it's it's a, all across the community and getting government bodies involved. At, this is where advocacy can really be effective in asking for this from government across the world and to create repositories so that, that people don't have to be tested over and over and this data can actually be used for bigger purposes and, and to learn more. If I can uh, add a plug for the International Alliance here, that there's a big role for, I think, to make sure all these different repositories talk to each other and can talk to each other. So we can, the data can be shared internationally, which sometimes can be an issue, I think. So I think uh, we can definitely uh, help people to work together and, and make that data more accessible. Um, there's a question here, which maybe uh, uh, Nadia can contribute to a little bit as well, because um, uh, we had a question about how many open seats there are in trials, and I don't know if any of the companies you have that information on a website or anything anywhere, but is that something you could consider? Is it even possible to incorporate it into the, the ALS TDI new, um, uh, your, oh, I've forgotten the name of your uh, uh, trial navigator, sorry. A trial navigator, yes. So yes. We we are, um, this is a question that we've seen a lot in the last few years. And uh, periodically I get people reaching out asking about how many trial seats are, are there. Um, so 
Um, I would love to throw some of this back to the companies that we have here today because we often don't hear what our exact enrollment numbers are, and there's reasons for that. Um, but for, for the trial navigator on our landing page, we actually will have, um, you know, how many interventional trials are there globally? Um, how many total interventional seats are there in trials globally? That those numbers are pasted there, and they're they will automatically update from. Um, from our daily updates that we do. So really excited to just have a place where people can go to see those numbers. Um, and yes, I'd love to hear from the companies if we can get more specific numbers on open seats because that is a consideration. I can just mention that Prelenia is now preparing for the phase three study. Um, we're going to start the phase three. There are currently no um, uh, recruitment. Um, there's just an open label study ongoing from the Healy study that our phase three will start um, at the second half of this year. Um, so we don't have a defined number. Uh, currently, we are working on the details of the, the protocol, and we will be very happy to share with you so you can post online. Of course, we will publish when we start, when the first patient will be in, um, any additional data, we're very happy to share with the community. I think it's, think it's probably helpful for this international community to understand from the perspective of companies, especially companies that are publicly traded in the US, the ongoing clinical trials and the number of spots filled in an ongoing clinical trial can actually be looked at externally by investors as a measurement of the success or potential that failure of a study or of a company. So for that reason, once a trial gets started, if a company is publicly traded, especially, it can be highly sensitive information and almost insider trading to share that information. So there, there are legal you know, investor community considerations for companies traded publicly in the U.S. to openly say, you know, our target is 600 people. We have you know, 35 enrolled today. And, and if a, a investor looks at that externally and says it took you, you know, a year to enroll half the trial, is this trial going to be successful? Or are you going to fail as a company? What does this mean for the outcome? So it creates a lot of speculation and a lot of risk for a company. So that's why you don't see, oh, we're halfway through enrollment. What you see is, as, as, um, as, as the previous presenter pointed out, is we started the trial, our target enrollment is 600, for example. What you may have noticed, our press release in 2023 said, we enrolled the last patient, into the Phoenix trial and we currently we now have enrolled 664 participants. We made that public once that was final, but the, so it's very it's very hard to as you go along to say we've got these exact seat numbers you know available. Oh Steve, go ahead. I saw you on mute. No, you go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just gonna say Becky you had a slide on the timeline. So uh, uh, absolutely correct that we are not uh, able to mention the number of patients currently enrolled, but um, could say that the enrollment is going to go through uh, 24 and early 25. And, you know, we'd love to hear these questions and, and also related genetic testing and the next one coming up about challenging challenges to enroll patients. Get tested, please. Talk to your healthcare provider. It's, it's super uh, to see the global community that's on this uh, website. So, you know, I think if you ask a, a sponsor uh, about enrollment, uh, you know, that's our biggest challenge. So uh, sooner the better for everybody. Uh, but yeah, we have over a year to go. So I think you know, the more we could identify the great. So plenty of, plenty of spaces <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, and then I, I can just quickly say on the, on the Biogen side, um, I think I mentioned the numbers for Atlas. So target enrollment in Part A, the natural history part is 150. So far we have 105 uh, enrolled and targeting uh, enrollment for Part B is 28 uh, participants. Um, so that's um, that's the current status of Atlas. And then the Tofersen open label extension trial, 233AS102 uh, that I spoke about during the presentation, uh, that trial has been uh, fully enrolled uh, for some time estimated to complete uh, mid this year. Um, and then those are only phase three studies that are currently ongoing. Uh, we do have another program that people may be familiar with, uh, the BIB-105 program, which is an antisense oligonucleotide um, designed to bind to and reduce ataxin-2 mRNA. Um, and that uh, program is currently in phase one, two in the ALSPIRE study. Um, 
So that's where we are, where we are currently at in terms of uh, overall studies and enrollment. I can just add a few um, words for clean. Um, as Mikhail said, we, you know, and Ben presented in his presentation, we are currently in the trial design phase. So exact numbers are not known. I think once our protocols are finalized, and as Michelle pointed out, once we are able to officially release the information and begin the trial, then we will happily share the information. At this point, it's under development. Um, it's nice to be able to share with the community where we stand, but even the trial design at this point is very much draft. Um, and uh, we, we like to share as much as possible. So it's nice to give you all an insight, but even the protocol is in, is in many ways draft form at this point. So once we have a final uh, consensus and number and the protocol is finalized, we will definitely share. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, just wanted to remind everyone to add questions to the, the Q&A box and then um, comments can go into the chat. Um, we have an additional question. Um, what challenges do you face when enrolling trials and are there ways that the advocacy community can help I can start with that one. Um, I think it's just in general for all clinical trials, but especially clinical trials in a um, relentlessly progressive disease like ALS. Um, I think some of the the biggest challenges are sites finding sites where patients are and where patients can have access or participants can have access broadly. Um, it you know, maintaining as someone progresses in their disease making sure that they can still continue to participate in the trial is a challenge. Uh, in all ALS trials, I mentioned this earlier, and we had this experience with the Centaur trial, I'm sure we'll see it with the Phoenix trial as it's longer, is that you know, as the disease progresses, people um, fall out of the trial sometimes because they no longer are able to travel to the site. And what we've tried to do and others on this call are doing as well is create more remote visits. COVID really educated us and helped us figure out um, that you can do remote SVC. You certainly can do remote ALS FRSR assessments. So um, we can overcome some of those challenges by incorporating more remote type visits. And I know everyone on this call has, uh, sponsors have done that. Um, and it, it, it extends beyond the ALS community. So I think that's that's one challenge that, that we have and we've tried to overcome using remote visits. And, they, and how advocacy can get involved is um, just educating the community, being able to advertise or not advertise, but create awareness like the tool that you're creating, Nadia, um, and other tools. And then locally within the countries, we had a great experience in, in Europe with the Phoenix trial, local advocacy, the UPAUS group, and the local advocacy groups as well, creating awareness with webinars. And um, you know, we have a website to, to send people to. I think creating awareness is is, uh, is, is key uh, and identifying patients, genetic testing. Uh, and, you know, other than enrolling, of course, there's the startup and uh, hurdles we have with regulators, uh, ethics committees, IRB. So uh, all the work that, that uh, advocacy groups are doing is, is, a, is fantastic. Uh, thank you for all your support in, in all areas of uh, drug development, really, not only about patient identification. So uh, we, we could improve in a lot of areas, and and hopefully every uh, buddy is uh, dedicated to this, which I'm sure they are. So we're making good progress, but uh, you know I think all of you know that it takes some time for startups, sometimes contracts and uh, reviews, and and yeah. So it, it's it's uh, we we do our best to move things along. But thank you for all your support. Yeah, thanks to the to the panelists and for the great question. I would say on the, the Atlas side, it would be the rarity of the population. So, you know, overall, SOD1 ALS represents about 2% of all ALS. Uh, and so in Atlas, we are recruiting individuals who carry SOD1 mutations who are pre-symptomatic, so we're even getting more rare. And then the mutations themselves um, have to be associated with higher complete penetrance and rapid disease progression. So it's a, it's a pretty small group that we are looking to enroll uh, within the Atlas studies, that that definitely brings some challenges. But as Chris and the panelists have have mentioned, events like this, uh, the platform that that Nadia um, and the and ALS TDI has has put forth, 
uh, these are hugely viable uh, resources to continue advancing drug development and, and rural studies in, in ALS. So thank you so much for all these opportunities. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I have one other question for you. Um, what are some of the more creative um, trial design uh, pieces that you're incorporating into your trial? So digital outcomes, patient reported outcomes, um, are there any creative inclusion exclusion criteria that tried to make your trials more inclusive? Um, would love to hear from you on this. I can maybe comment quickly. Um, so we have been very encouraged by using some of very sophisticated and new uh, measures to test speech um, that up until now um, were more exploratory in studies and still in, in discussions with uh, regulatory agencies. So this is something that we are very, really focusing on, um, adding as many uh, as possible and most you know, advanced algorithm and way to measure speech and to do it and to make it as easy as possible for the participant. So using a device or an app that they can do at home and not, the, and not only during scheduled visits, but anytime, several times a day, several times a week, um, whenever is comfortable for them. And I think this will really um, make it easy for the participants and make uh, very uh, valuable data available for us as a company and of course to share with your community um, that has a critical impact. Uh, so speech is such an important aspect of the disease. I think this is something novel that we are um, very much keen on uh, and working strongly with other partners to, to advance. Nadia, we also in the Phoenix trial <clears throat> have incorporated PROs so the outset Q40, but also a caregiver burden assessment. So we're really looking forward to um, seeing how that is helpful for the community, but it also can be really helpful when it comes to certain countries for reimbursement, when they look for in improving not only the quality of life of the person living with the disease, but also of their caregiver team. Same for our current, uh, at least draft design, um, the patient reported outcomes and quality of life uh, tools are being incorporated as well as Michelle mentioned earlier, remote visits. We have, you know, every alternate visit um, is going to be uh, hopefully a remote option for patients. Um, one of the tools, for example, that um, we will be uh, utilizing is the fatigue scale. Just how do people feel? Um, and uh, we've got several others, and, and hopefully that'll give us great insight. Um, we have a, another question around uh, selection of uh, trial sites as well. I think we, we did discuss it a little earlier, but um, we've had uh, a few comments talking about from Spain and Greece how keen they are to get trials coming to their countries. So, um, is there a balance, obviously, you have your selection criteria for trial sites, but how much do you take into account, say, the perhaps the, you say the enthusiasm of the uh, of the trial site or the hosting country to try and support trials coming there? Do, can they really influence that and really make make their uh, their countries or their area more, more appealing uh, and more suitable for, uh, for you guys? I think just like the, the, the patient community, we want um, the, the trials to be as smooth and easy and you know not to avoid any unnecessary delays. Um, so I, I cannot speak on a specific, uh, I'm not aware any, of any specific difficult countries, but of course that uh, if we want to execute the study um, as quickly and most efficient as possible, if we know a specific country or a specific site, will not be easy. I guess we would try to avoid it for everyone's uh, benefit. But I, I'm not aware of anything like you know, of that sort. Okay. I could just add the question asked about whether the companies choose the site or site's interest matter. It's both a combination, of course. Uh, we need uh, centers that are capable and have the uh, correct uh, equipment, staffing, experience. Uh, but of course, they also have to 
want to participate. They may have limited resources, uh, even if they're capable. So it's a uh, discussion with interested uh, centers and their investigators. Thank you. Um, do you have any uh, further questions, uh, Nadia? You wanted to? No, I think that we've actually covered everything on my end. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all our panelists because uh, it's been a fantastic open discussion. I know the, you, there's always constraints about what you're allowed to discuss and we can say, and I think it's been a, a really good discussion here and we've managed to cover an incredible range of, of, of topics. Um, so I think at this point, uh, apart from obviously thanking you and thanking all our audience as well for uh, a, a great set of questions coming in as well. So it's uh, uh, it really um, highlights the uh, the uh, broad sort of uh, church that we have in the Alliance as well and the different issues that affect people in, di in different areas. So I'll hand it back now to Jess to, uh, to wind it up. Yeah, thank you very much, Gethin. Uh, on behalf of the Alliance, I want to say thank you to our panelists, our presenters for participating in this webinar, for updating us and answering the questions from our community. Thank you also to our moderators today, Gethin Thomas and Nadia Sethi. We also want to th thank all of you participating in clinical trials, working so hard towards the world without ALS and MD. And a big thank you, of course, to our audience for joining us today. Uh, thank you for all your questions and pre-submitted questions. I wish you all a great morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you very much.